Welcome to Next Steps, a podcast from Black Hawk Church in Madison, Wisconsin, where together we'll take next steps to grow in our relationship with Christ, to be formed into the kind of people He's created us to be, and to better love and serve those around us. Let's jump in. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Next Steps podcast. This is Blackhawk Church's podcast, and we've been away for a while, but we are so excited that we are starting this up again. Um, If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Michael Knapstad. I am the pastor of College Age Ministry and Internships here at Blackhawk Church. Uh, If you're not a college age person or an intern, then you might not know me. I I teach occasionally at Blackhawk, but man, I'm really excited to be here. We are in a series uh, called Under Construction, where we are talking about deconstruction and reconstruction. I'm one of the hosts, but I'm also really excited that I'm not the only host. I'm here with someone very special. Uh, She's awesome. And yeah, why don't you, uh, Veronica, introduce yourself in a little bit about what you do. Yeah, I'm Veronica Hummel. I'm on staff here at Blackhawk with our spiritual formation team. I'm the Associate Director of Spiritual Formation, so I oversee all of our Bible studies and our groups and courses and our tools and resources. So this is like really exciting to me to kind of get to dig a little bit deeper into a Sunday sermon series because the people definitely don't know me. If they don't know you, they definitely don't know me. I have a more behind the scenes role. So it's fun to be able to kind of dive in a little bit deeper on the Sunday experience here. Yeah, I'm excited for this podcast, one, to dig deeper, but two, you know, people always say that I have a face for podcasting. So I'm just really excited to, you know, get to experience what that means. So yeah. (laughs) Just well, joking. as Michael mentioned, the podcast was on hiatus for a little bit um, while we were just kind of um, figuring out what we wanted to do with it. We didn't want to put out content just to put out content. And we really felt like this um, sermon series was a great time mm-hmm. to bring it back, to have some of these other conversations, to um, really address some of these topics because they're really important yeah. topics that we're excited to talk about on Sundays, but we also want to have another space to do that. Totally. So we're excited for that. So we will be here every week. Um, the hope is that we'll post something after uh, the message. So yeah, we'll be your hosts. And from time to time, we're going to mix it up and bring some other people in. So mm-hmm. we're pumped for this. I'm excited just as a church to be able to journey kind of like what you were saying on these important subjects. So man, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for this. Me too. So let's dive in. Let's do it. Um, Okay, so as you mentioned, we're talking about deconstruction and reconstruction in this series. And uh, in case people don't know, you had a big hand in developing the sermon series. So why don't you share a little bit about uh, why we're actually talking about this as a church in general? Yeah, great question. So um, I've been uh, teaching at Black Hawk for a couple years now, and a lot of people might not be familiar with the teaching team process. It's actually it's actually a pretty extensive process, and I love being a part of it. Um, but the process, I won't go over the whole process, but uh, the beginning of the process is um, uh, some people from the teaching team, typically Charles, maybe uh, Matt and um, Chris Dolson, will uh, talk about what different series could look like. And so um, there's this whole like big map with all of these like Old Testament books and New Testament books and Topics that we have talked about in the past years. It's really cool. Um, but we haven't done uh, an apologetics uh, series in a while. And for those of you who might not know uh, what that kind of Christian apologetics word is, it's kind of like uh, how, how do you defend or communicate your faith? And so, um, so Chris Dolson was going to be the series captain um, on an apologetic series. And I was invited uh, into uh, being a co-captain first time. It was awesome. Uh, so Chris and I actually took a day and really talked about, you know, Blackhawk Church, people in Madison or people around Madison, around the ro- world, people who are listening uh, to us, uh, wherever you're at, um, people who are a part of our community what do we feel like people either need to hear or want to hear when it comes to defending or talking about their faith? 
And so we were talking for a while. Um, we got Chipotle just eating, uh, having a conversation. And we, we both really talked about this idea of just deconstruction. And uh, a lot of people might not know what the word deconstruction is. If you don't, and if you haven't listened to Chris's message uh, this past Sunday, you have to. Like, honestly, it was a phenomenal message. And I'm not just saying that because Chris is awesome. Like, I wish that I would have heard this message when I was in college, um, when I I really went through some deconstruction stuff, but basically, you know, Chris shared about how in different ways we can deconstruct things. He talked about how, like, if you're, um, kind of remodeling a home, you might poke holes in the wall and tear some things down. Um, and in the, and when it comes to our faith, we can deconstruct different areas of our faith. We had this construct, and you always start with a construct, whether it's parents or society or church giving you a construct. We have this construct of um, this is what we could or should believe, and then we go about with that, but then something happens, whether we come to school or... um, you know, we're in a new workplace or a community or a tragic event happens and, and what we have constructed holes are poked in the wall and we start to what we call deconstruct, uh, different things. And, um, I don't know when this kind of became a popular Christian term, but I think it was maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, seven, 10 years Mm ago. Uh, and when it became a term, deconstruction was it. People just kind of deconstructed their faith until there was, wasn't even a house left. And I have so many friends, um, who went through that, that painful journey and really walked away from their faith. But in the past few years, this idea of reconstructing, um, pairing it with deconstructing has come out. There's a lot of books being written right now on it. And, uh, you know, it could actually be a Reconstruction is a beautiful and a biblical thing if we pair it with that. So long story long, uh, Chris and I were talking for a while and we thought, man, we feel like so many people are are there right now or have been there or really will be there. So why not, um, instead of uh, like defending our faith in the sense of what a typical apologetic series could be, uh, what if we really talk about this idea of deconstructing or reconstructing really in these kind of big areas that that we can like next week I'll I'll actually be talking about like what if I love Jesus but I struggle with Christians and a lot of us have had to deconstruct that and what does reconstruction look like that mm-hmm. with that suffering science and faith so different topics like that so yeah. Well, thanks so much for the good work you guys did on this sermon, because I am so excited. When I heard you guys first talking about it, I actually, as you were talking, I remember running into you while you and Chris were at that day away. Oh, yeah. You, we ran into you on that. campus. Yeah, you were with husband, your my kids. Family. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know why that came to mind, but um, but it was so exciting to hear you guys talking about this, because I think, like I said, it's just such important conversations to yeah. be having. So, But I also know that like some people maybe have loved ones who have gone through the deconstruction process, but maybe not the reconstruction process. And they're maybe nervous for us to have this, have this conversation really as a church, because they just don't, they just want to kind of ignore it. Or they think if we talk about it or acknowledge it at all, that it's going to cause more, more damage or more hurt. So what, what would you say to those people? Yeah. If, if you are in an area of deconstruction right now, first, I want to speak to you and say, you're not alone. I think you know, you might not be familiar with the the term deconstruction, or at least in this context, but I think a lot of us are familiar with the reality that we can experience. And when it happens in different areas of our faith, man, it can feel not just like poking a hole in a wall, like a sheetrock wall, but it can feel like foundation mm. rattling. And if you're there right now, I just want to say you're not alone. Uh, you might feel alone, but man, you have people who are not only there with you, but who have actually reconstructed. And um, if you know a loved one that has deconstructed, I I also think that no one's really to the point of deconstruction where the Holy Spirit can't... um, can't be invited in or come in to, uh, to an area where re- reconstruction can happen. Yeah, that's a great um, point. I don't think ever, anyone is, is lost. As long as you have breath in, in your lungs, the Holy Spirit is able to come and, um, and invite you into what reconstruction can look like. But yeah, it's, it, I think the idea of deconstruction is scary. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, but at Blackhawk Church, we just want to move towards things. We're not a church, I think, that like kind of pulls punches or or um, kind of skirts around different things. We're like, hey, this is hard, but yeah. we want to link arms together. So for those of you who might be like, I don't know, like I think I'm going through that and I don't want to look at it or I have a loved one. I don't know. Man, let's link arms together and let's let's navigate this with wisdom um, because I really feel that Christ wants to um, really I mean, build all of our faiths. Yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's yeah. kind of my I mean, response I think to it that. Is. So, well. yeah. How about you? I mean, like when you heard that, like when we were walking, Chris and I, and saw you with your kids, your little team mm-hmm. of children, so cute. Um, and we said, yeah, I think we're going to go this direction. What was your initial thought about that? Just being a part of Black Hawk, a part of, you know, determining what courses look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what you said that like we don't shy away from things here at Blackhawk. We just kind of move towards them because we want to have the hard conversations. I mean, I think that's true. I th- I just think that's really true about us as a church. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that I value personally. Um, so I, it's not fun always. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. always feel like the best time to have those hard conversations, but I think that they're important and we see the value of them. And I think they strengthen our faith in the end. So I, um, I think I was, I was excited, but I think too, there's like a, a sense about me that I'm kind of interested in these questions on an intellectual level too. Yeah, I think there's yeah. the like heart posture, but there's also the intellectual posture. So I think some of them will touch all of us differently, right? Yeah. Like if you, if you, um, have not gone through a time of like real deep suffering yet in your life, um, that conversation is going to touch you in a different spot than if you have. Right. Mm. So I think, um, some of these topics that we talk about on Sundays, we might come to from a more intellectual level of like, Oh, that's really interesting. And that kind of actually stores away for us later in life. If we do run into those spaces Mm. where those questions come up, those will, those conversations will come back to us. Um, but then, um, some of these conversations might be harder because they might've touched us more deeply or, and we might still be hurting from some of those things. Um, or we might just remember when we were in that place and it felt really raw. So I think I was both excited and also about a like, Oh, well, this is, this is going to be good, but it's going to be hard. Yeah. That's awesome. Here's another question. Um, before we dive into a couple other things. I mean, you sit on the spiritual formations team, Mm -hmm. uh, your team, I mean, it's a big, a big charge that you guys are leading, but what does it look like to steer Blackhawk church, uh, in a way where we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so with you just sitting on that team, if you can speak for your team, um, what are you guys excited about this series? Oh man, we are, I mean, I think we're excited about a lot of things, but I think, uh, just what you said about transformation, um, our team just really, really desires for, everyone at Black Hawk Church to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Um, And we just really want to provide opportunities for that um, in the big church, you know, ecosystem of like Sunday sermons are a big part of that. Worship, musical worship is a big part of that. Serving is a big part of that. Um, Courses, Bible study. We have so many opportunities that are, can be really transformative. Um, and, and I do think that this convert, this sermon series is going to be great conversations in community groups. I think that's going to be a place yeah. where it really shows up a lot. So if you're not plugged in to a community group right now, community groups are open for registration. Yeah. That's not, um, that was not in a planned plug. We but didn't plan that plug. <laughs> we didn't plan it, but here we are plugged. But, um, but I think there's just, yeah, there's a lot to move forward to here and just being open to letting the Holy Spirit work, um, in our lives in places where we might be nervous about it or where it might feel unfamiliar is, I think good for all of us. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Hey, let's just, let's jump in. I mean, we are talking about deconstruction and reconstruction and it's honestly, it, it, I love what you said about, Um, there's an intellectual kind of posture, but also a heart posture. But I think regardless if it's a intellectual or a heart posture, it's a vulnerable, like there's, it's vulnerable. I mean, it's a vulnerable process to say, this is the way that I've constructed this area of my faith. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I feel like holes are being poked, Mm -hmm. um, walls are being opened, um, that I didn't want to be. And so whether it's intellectual or heart, 
or a mixture of both for me. Often it's a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, it can be vulnerable. So um, since we're the hosts for this Next Up podcast for the next uh, handful of weeks, I thought it could be cool, Veronica, uh, for us to maybe be vulnerable and just share different ways that we've kind of navigated deconstruction in the process of reconstruction. Yeah. Um, well, if you know me at all in my personal life, you know that uh, I'm that person. I, I, mm. I joke sometimes that I'm an oversharer because <laughs> get ready I, for the I'm overshare. Vu- people. I'm vulnerable all the Let's time. Let's do it. Um, no, so I think I think actually what you said too about like shaking the foundations is like yeah. really it does really feel like that sometimes. And um, I think in my personal story, I didn't come to faith until I was a senior in high school. So I think I had an interesting opportunity to like build that foundation. I think some people kind of inherit the foundation that they're given, you know, from their family or their church background, or sometimes even just like kind of the culture that they're swimming in. Um, And there was a little bit of that for me. I grew up in Colorado Springs, which is like very sort of culturally churched, even though I had never been a part of a church. Um, But I think there was a real opportunity and an excitement for me to kind of build that foundation and do that construction to, Mm -hmm. and be an active part in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that was exciting. But then um, when we when we moved to Madison, we had left the only church really that I had ever gone to. Um, and I'm so glad we landed at Blackhawk. We have loved our time at Blackhawk and uh, continue to be here for a long time, hopefully. Um, but, I, you know, there were some things that I was like that our church in Colorado did that we don't necessarily do here at Blackhawk or it looked different. And there were, there were things that, you know, I had to grapple with a little bit of like, um, well, why don't all churches do this? And why mm. do some churches do it differently than other churches? Like greeting each other with a holy kiss. Yes, like absolutely. Black, That's no, a just, definitely we what we don't did. Do no, that I'm just I just joke. <laughs> but there were some good things that too of like our church in Colorado always felt, um, I never really felt like I could show up and be my full self mm. there in some ways. Um, particularly around um, women in leadership and women women in ministry at that church. Um, so I think I always kind of felt a little uncomfortable with that. And then um, coming to Blackhawk felt more comfortable mm. in that I saw more areas where women were leading and, and could lead more opportunity for that. But then that really also kind of um, triggered a question for me of like, well, if both of these things can be true at churches – is that bad? Like, mm. is it bad that some churches, that, that churches disagree, Yeah, you know, and kind of grappling with that kind of contradiction a little bit um, and, and being okay with the fact that different churches land in different spaces on that and different people, even at, yeah. you know, at Blackhawk will land at different places on that topic. Um, so I kind of had to work through that. Yeah. Um, and then it, it was a little bit later in life, a few years later where I went through some pretty significant personal challenges. Um, a big one was, uh, when my dad died, he died really mm. suddenly and pretty traumatically when I was 25. And that was um, really challenging for me. Um, and, yeah. you know, I'm so sorry. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really tough. It was a really hard year. And um, just kind of walking through that with the Lord of like, I don't understand why this happened. Where were you in this? Um, and, and, and I mean, ultimately, I came to the fact that like God was with me in that process. He never left me. Um, but it doesn't mean that it was easy or it wasn't hard. Um, and then, you know, several years later, um, a lot of people we know too know that my, my husband and I struggled with infer- infertility for many years. So mm. It took us five years to have our boys, yeah. um, our older two. And that was a really hard process too. You know, when you're, uh, you know, we were in our thirties, we'd been married for a long time. We saw a lot of our friends, everyone in our community group yeah. <laughs> having kids and we were the only ones really struggling with this and grappling with this. And it felt so isolating and it felt so like, it felt so hard because I knew that God had never promised me children. Like we'd, you know, that's not in the Bible. He didn't, you know, we didn't have that conversation, me and God. Um, But it still was just like, he he knows the desires of my heart. And why would he put that desire there and not provide an opportunity for it? And, you know, um, our, our situation turned out that now we are blessed with three great little boys, but not, mm-hmm. but I also know that not everybody's situation turns out that way. Not yeah. everyone gets their happy ending. You know, like when my dad died, that was not a happy ending. Um, and he, as far as I know, is not a believer and it may never be a happy ending, you know, yeah. for me and my dad. But, um, at the end of the day, I really came back to like, like I said, I could see God's hand and how he provided for me mm, that's in kind those of the reconstruction situations. side of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I, 
I never really felt like he left me. I mm. felt like I had a lot of questions and I had um, a lot of, you know, just pain, but yeah. I never really felt like God ever left. And wow. so. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Like, yeah. That thanks for being vulnerable. I think that's a gift uh, that you've given us there. Uh, yeah. When you were talking, man, reconstruction is hard. And just mm-hmm. maybe I'll just say what we've, we talked about deconstruction, but reconstruction is the idea of, okay, so like, let's say I bought a house and it was made in the fifties. Nothing has been changed. It's 2024. I want to make some changes. And so I'm going to take down some walls. Maybe I'm going to, you know, put a window here. You're, you're deconstructing some things, but you're reconstructing it to make it to make it different and to make it new and hopefully to make it a place that you just feel like you belong more. It's better. It's, it's, it can be more beautiful. So you're reconstructing it. You're learning more. And the idea is we're not reconstructing away from the Bible. Mm -hmm. We're trying to like double down and say like, okay, well, what, what does the Bible actually say? Like how are my interpretations perhaps off or just to come to the place where it's like, I think this is what God's actually saying. And I don't know if I believe or agree with it. What am I going to do? You know, how can I reconstruct my own uh, thoughts around this? Uh, So reconstruction, the the goal is that it's different and and hopefully a place that's, that's, that you can call your home. um, I don't want to say better, but, but in some, some circumstances, but anyway, I wanted to talk briefly about reconstruction and what that means. But to say that when you were sharing Veronica, I think that when we come to different areas where we are deconstruction, uh, deconstructing, often deconstruction isn't a choice. It happens to us, whether it's an environment that we're in or something, you know, there's a challenge we're thrust into deconstruction. But what I do think is a choice is reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I think if we don't choose reconstruction and we allow ourselves to slip down the road of deconstruction, then that's where our faith can die. Yeah. But if we make the choice, even if we don't have the tools or even the willpower to reconstruct, but if we say, okay, God, or okay, friend, okay, Mm -hmm. I don't know what reconstruction looks like, but I want to turn towards it. Yeah. Help. And, you know, different areas you were sharing that, like you did that. And yeah. I don't know. That's brave. And Oof. so. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, when, when I was in those spaces though, I do remember what you're talking about. Like I, there were some days where I, most days, uh, in there that I didn't even have the energy ability wherewithal to be able to like really even formulate prayers of just like, yeah. God, I'm so like upset right now. Yeah. I can't, I don't even know how to talk to you right now. Um, but I think the thing that really helped was going to the Bible, seeing where people did that in the Bible, going yeah. to having that, you know, like having our community around us and having people and churches, the churches that we were a part of during those seasons, um, were churches like Blackhawk and we went to another church cause we lived away briefly, but, yeah. um, that were okay with that. Like we were, mm. we, it was okay to kind of be in those spaces and to yeah. not be, you know, um, perfect and have it all together, but to be hurting and to still come to church and to be in fellowship with other believers in those spaces while we were in the midst of that pain. That's so good. And I want to answer the question or at least talk about deconstruction too, but like, I don't know if there's so many things that you said that I'm like, I want to talk about this. <laughs> no, no, uh, you but, can talk too. <laughs> you know, but I, but, but again, to what you're saying though, um, man, I love that you and your husband were able to go to a place of worship and lament. I think that the lament is, I think the road to reconstruction is paved with lament. Yeah. And when we, we look at Psalms, which is the book of worship, mm-hmm. a third of it is lament. Yeah. You know, I think in America, most American churches, we don't like lead worship songs that are full of lament. Like mm-hmm. if you open some of it, it's raw, yeah. like David pouring his heart out to God. But but it, I mean, it makes it, it takes the courageous decision to say like, this is going to be messy. It's going to be hard, but I'm not going to go around my pain. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go through my pain because, because that's how I get to, to reconstruct. And man, if, if, if anyone is right now in the process of reconstruction, reconstructing, keep going, keep going, Yeah. Uh, man, it's hard. But as Chris said, don't do it alone. Right. right. So yeah. anyway. So you have your own stories. Yeah. Yeah. But 
uh, yeah, man. Okay. So I'm actually teaching on Sunday and Mm -hmm. there is one story that like comes to my mind first, but I'm going to share that on Sunday. So we'll just wait. There you go. We'll just wait in anticipation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I, the the first thing that kind of came, no, the second thing I should say that came (laughs) to my mind. Um, I remember, so I graduated uh, college in 2007 you all can do the math. <laughs> and I took two years off. Same year I graduated, by you the way. You did? Yes. Wow, we're the same age. I mean, wow. I think you're a little older than me. Oh, I'm Don't older. Tell anyone. Okay, I won't. <laughs> so you took a gap year before? Uh, no, I just graduated a semester early. Oh, whatever. Okay, there you go. We got it. <laughs> Not to brag. Smart. You're the intellectual. Okay, great. No, um, anyway, focus, Michael. Uh, so I graduated in 2007 and took two years off and... Um, And I did a lot of church volunteering and stuff. And I knew that I wanted to go to seminary to become a pastor. And I remember a few of my uh, friends saying, hey, we're actually really concerned that you're going to go to seminary because we know people who have gone to seminary and they've totally lost their faith. Mm -hmm. This was before deconstruction was really a buzzword in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so it was just... they would call uh, seminary cemetery. That's where your faith goes to die. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm like, wow, this is really encouraging friends. I'm so glad cool, cool. that glad you're, I made this decision. You've really, you've really set me up well. So I was in uh, North of Seattle during that time. And long story short, rains all the time in Seattle and it's awesome, but I needed some sun. So I went to Southern California, uh, Fuller Seminary, which was awesome. But from what my friends said, I prepared myself, I think, for deconstruction Mm. um, because multiple people were really kind of cautious about that. So for me, I I wanted to say like, okay, going into this, there are probably going to be different. um, And I think this is true for most seminaries, not just Fuller, you know, anytime you're going into higher education and you're really with a microscope looking at different um, theological things, looking at the Bible, there's going to be questions. It's going to, you know, shake some things. So when I entered into it, I was like, okay, Michael, what are the non-negotiables? What are the non-negotiables about your faith, about your relationship with Jesus, Mm -hmm. that no matter how hard someone pushes, Mm -hmm. no matter how big the sledgehammer is to the house that Jesus and you have built when it comes to your faith, faith, that's a no-go. Yeah. What are the, like, what are the foundational beams that if they hit that, your house is tumbling. And so that was my journey. And, and there's a couple, and I love, I actually love our denomination, um, uh, because we call it like majoring in the majors. Like yeah. what are the major things? And, you know, like Jesus as God, G- salvation coming from him, um, the resurrection, all of those big things, those, these are my non-negotiables. And, mm-hmm. And if anyone tries to push me away from that, like I, I'm not, I'm not close to the conversation. I'm not close to learning, but I definitely, um, like these are things that I wrestled with before and they're, they're foundational. So I went into that, but other things I honestly was like, okay, I can have open hands with this. And here's one example. Um, I took a gospels class by uh, a professor named Marion May Thompson. I called her MMT. What up, MMT? Sure You're not listening to that. this, but <laughs> she's awesome. But anyways, um, and it was really cool, but it brought a lot of different like theological deconstruction in like entering that class. Uh, like the first week or two, we would just kind of look at different verses that um, Matthew or Mark would write and the inconsistencies Mm, in them. mm -hmm. So the inconsistencies led to deconstruction in my mind. If this gospel writer is saying there was, for example, one cult (laughs) in this one, there's two cults. Do I just throw it all out? Yeah. And I remember really wrestling like in it and dug down to, well, do I just not believe in the Bible. You know, like it was this kind of spiral. I was deconstructing. And then my, uh, Marion May Thompson, she, uh, reconstructed the class to say, Hey, I'll never forget it. How beautiful that gospels are witnesses. There are witnesses of, um, how Matthew, Mark, Luke, John have, uh, encountered and seen the life of Jesus. And when, when I witness something like both of us right now, we're in a podcast, we're in a podcast, we see each other, we, we're looking at this room that we're in at Blackhawk, when we leave, Mm -hmm. and we go talk to, you know, our significant other about what if if we do, you know, (laughs) about what the podcast was, because it's so cool, we're going to share with everyone. (laughs) 
I'm going to have a witness that's different than yours. Yeah, that's You're going to share something that is, I might be like, yeah, there was like 10 chairs. And you're like, actually, I counted there was 12 chairs. We have a different witness on things. And it doesn't mean that the experience didn't happen or we didn't create a podcast, but we're leaving with a different witness. And so that small example for me was a reconstruction to mm-hmm. say, hey, like, maybe the Bible is bigger than what I thought it was. When I had this construct idea, maybe it's bigger. And I have a ton of examples uh, that are different, but kind of similar to that. But I don't know, it, it gave me a bigger appreciation for being able to enter reconstruction with open hands, still with a lot of questions, because I, it just, for me, when you allow the reconstruction process to happen, like your faith can become bigger and more beautiful. And I found that like different people who are skeptical, let's say of, okay, well, how can you trust the Bible when there's inconsistencies? Like when you share different experiences that you've had, like witness, it's kind of cool to be like, for them to be like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. And they are invited into a reconstruction area. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a great point. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's great. I wish I, I hope I can meet MMT someday. She's maybe, great. I'll, maybe I'll go out to Fuller and meet her. You should. I'll introduce you. <laughs> Thank anyway, you so much. Yeah. So well, this was cool for us to just share a couple things, but I don't know. Here, here's a question for you, Veronica. Why do you think it's important for us to have these types of conversations? Like what we just had mm-hmm. as a church. I know you're in spiritual formations. You lead courses, mm-hmm. community groups. That's a thing where you are kind of, uh, you're on the same team that thinks about these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why are these conversations important? Well, I think, I mean, we've sort of talked about a little bit of like it, these conversations are already happening. Um, people are going, going to have these conversations. People are going to have these questions. Um, and if we're not having the conversation, they're going to have it somewhere. Um, so I, you know, I don't want, and and Chris gave a great example of one of his friends and mentors that was just doing this in isolation. And that, um, I think we both shared in our stories about people who helped us rebuild or reconstruct. And, um, if we're doing this on our own, it feels so isolating. Actually, one of the hardest parts of part of my story was when my husband and I actually moved. We lived in Boston for a year. We had a great church there, but we were only there for a year. So, I mean, it's, it's tough to get plugged into a place really deeply in that short a period of time. And, um, feeling isolated in those places was tough. So it took a lot of work for us to kind of pull out of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, and we did have a church that felt comfortable. And so I think, um, if we, if we do that in a space where we're doing it on our own and we're just going to the internet or YouTube videos or, you know, Instagram or something for this, maybe I'm dating myself by referencing Instagram, (laughs) but, um, then I, we're not really doing it in community. We're still doing it on our own. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, you know, we were talking about earlier, I was talking about how uh, reconstruction is a decision. Yeah, that's a great point. So in different areas that I've deconstructed, there's kind of like an internal uh, check where I'm like, do I really want to grow in this or do I really want to continue down the road of deconstruction? Mm -hmm. And there's times where I've continued down the road of deconstruction, maybe not in areas of faith, but in different areas. And when I want to continue down that road, I do one of two things. One, I do it alone, which is a scary echo chamber because it's just my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And it's a, yeah, scary downward spiral. Two, I find people who, who will agree with my deconstruction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People who will be like, yep, you're totally right. Like, yep, if the Bible has two inconsistencies, you got to throw it out. That's why I don't believe in the Bible anymore. So I kind of know what I'm doing when I choose one or two of those. I want to mm-hmm. see how far down this the lonely road of deconstruction can be. But when I know that I want to reconstruct, I'm going to go to someone who is at a different place than me. Maybe they're more, hopefully they're more wise. And I'm going to choose vulnerability and just say, Hey, can we talk? Like, can I just process with you where I'm at? I'm Mm -hmm. not assuming that you have the answers, but I can't do this alone. And so that choice to find the right person or the right place is important. And to, to let your ideas be challenged and to let your deconstruction be challenged. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so often we seek confirming you know, confirming opinions or confirming evidence, because we, like you said, we want to be around people that agree with us, but really being vulnerable and opening us ourselves up to and, and allowing and having people in our lives that will challenge us, that will say that, 
um, and provide different perspectives is, is so important. Yeah. So Veronica, here's another question for you. We're talking about reconstruction now and you've mentioned at the beginning, and I know we'll end this, this podcast conversation with different like next steps, different tools that can be available. But in this area of reconstruction, maybe from your, maybe from your own life or just kind of where you're sitting on the spiritual formation team, what does it look like to reconstruct in a healthy way? Hmm. Um, I mean, that's a great question. I think it's probably going to look slightly differently for everybody. Mm. Um, some of it's just, you know, how you process. I'm an external processor. So I, um, I actually do tend to seek other people to kind of process things with Mm. not everybody does that naturally. So I think that's really where the temptation to isolation can go is if you're, Mm. if you're not, if that's not really part of your personality, but, um, that's really helpful for me. Um, I've actually found that one of the best things for my spiritual formation, both for my construction and reconstruction, all of this has been, um, group Bible study mm. because I'm bringing the scriptures, the truth of the scriptures, but I'm also doing it in community with other people that have different life experiences. Um, I actually really love that our Bible study is multi-generational and actually the one I started yeah. at in Colorado was that way too. Mm. Because like you said, you get people that are further along down the path. They're not in the same space as you. Um, So I think uh, communal Bible study is like, has been personally one of the most helpful things for me. Um, But I I do like to read too. So I like getting books from, you know, notable authors, people, people that I trust that I know our church trusts, things like Mm -hmm. that. Um, My husband is an intellectual, so he, he loves a good book when he's searching searching for something. So um, yeah. What about you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I shared a little bit about choosing someone, someone wise, uh, to reconstruct with one. I just, I think, I mean, I'm the college pastor here and I, I just think of a lot of different college students and, you know, I just want to touch back a little bit to what I was saying about how, like, if you want to go towards, um, if you want to continue down the road of deconstruction, find people who are thinking like you, man, I just see on the, like in the internet, there are just like chat rooms and different groups that, that really can have been decon- like, like dangerous to yeah. a lot of people. It's like, Hey, this is what we all believe. And it's this echo chamber. So man, I just think having your radar up, um, in a big way when it comes to that is, is super important. Um, but I think for me, Um, the word being open to wrestling, I think Mm -hmm. is, is a big, a big thing for me. And I, I, I just love, I mean, I love the Bible and I love how like today we're invited to wrestle with Mm -hmm. God, man. If Charles has said this before, different teaching team people, if you believe a hundred percent what the Bible says and you're like, yep, totally makes sense. That's great. I wonder if you're bringing your, your actual intelligence, your mind Mm, to it, because mm -hmm. the Bible was written over like what, 1500 years by multiple different authors, multiple different languages and a cultural context that don't really relate to our cultural context. So there needs to be some investigation. And not only that, we, we are human. God is God. Like we're not going to understand the ways of God. And that's why I love this idea of wrestling. I think deconstruction and reconstruction, like one of the, one of the friends and both of that is wrestling. But I love how I was just reading the story of Jacob. Um, so I'm kind of like a, like a, I don't know, organized guy in the sense of like, I have my routines and I listen to the Bible every morning uh, when I'm getting ready. And I just restarted listening to the Bible again because it's a new year. And I just listened to the story of Jacob in, um, in Genesis. And I love how he was Jacob. And then he wrestled all night with God. Yeah. And I'm just like, I've heard the story before. I'm like, that's kind of crazy. Like, to wrestle with God. No, can you imagine? No. And then God like hurts his hip where I get it. Like if you're going <laughs> to wrestle with God, like you're not like something's going to hurt. I don't know. But uh, after he was done, what's interesting is that God renamed him yeah. after like a, a wrestling match. And he didn't name him like guy who's hit by hurt, <laughs> which, you know, that's what happened. He renamed him. What's the him, Hebrew word for that? He, um, ask Charles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he renamed him Israel, which means to wrestle with God. Mm-hmm. So God knew that this was like the father of his people. Like Abraham was a father, but like that his, like his people will be named Israel to wrestle with God. So when we are making the decision to reconstruct, that comes with wrestling. Yeah. 
It comes with wrestling and that's okay. God knows it. And that's why he said, my people are the people who wrestle with me. And so I wonder what it could look like if we lean into that identity, but we don't wrestle alone. Like we need people on the sidelines. We need people lifting us up. We need people helping us. We need Mm -hmm. people stronger than us as we wrestle, but to know reconstruction, there's wrestling. Yeah. It's not fun. It's never great doing home renovations in your house or in your life and in your faith, but it's worth it. So that's what I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Well, this has been a good conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm excited for the next one, but we, resources. You are you have yeah. like a line to different resources because the yeah. Spiritual Formations team, um, you guys uh, kind of like curate all of those and collect all mm-hmm. of those. You want to um, just share a little bit about maybe what resources could be or where people can find it. If, you know, something in this conversation or in what Chris talked about on Sunday perked someone's um, heart or mind. Yeah. Yeah. We have a bunch of options. So the first sort of go to anytime you're looking for resources around sermon series um, is we have a tools and resources page for each sermon series. So and we actually um, usually only put up resources for each sermon as they come. But we decided for this series because um, they, these are some big questions that people are going to be wrestling with. We put up all the resources already. So there's some general sort of deconstruction, reconstruction resources that we've linked to, including the um, the book that you and Chris both read, After Doubt by A.J. Swoboda. It's a great book. He's got a great podcast, too, if you're not, uh, mm-hmm. if you're like, I don't have time to read a whole book, guys. Um, I'm a podcast guy. I, I do know. love reading, but like I love, to, yeah. Well, so. it's a good thing we're both podcast people since we're on <laughs> would, a podcast I right don't now. like podcasts. <laughs> Everyone no, no. stops listening. Um, um, and then there's other resources on there too for each specific topic. So yeah. we'll, and we'll be adding to that page as we go along. So um, if you're looking for something and you go on there and you find something you really like, um, check back too, because we might add some, some things as we go along. So that would be your first option. Um, if you have some of these big questions, maybe you're new to faith, maybe you've been around the church for a while, but you're just kind of in a place where you've got a lot of questions. Mm. Um, we've, uh, launched registration for all of our courses, but alpha in particular is going to be one that I think is going to be really valuable for people in this space. So they start, um, January 18th. So that's next week, Mm -hmm. but registration is still open. And even if it's, if you hear this after registration has closed or after, I mean, registration won't close, but if you hear this after the course has started, you can still go online and register and show up. That's on our website too, under the, um, all of these are going to be under the learn tab. Mm -hmm. Next steps, go to blackhawk.church, next steps, learn, and then you'll find all of these. Um, what about for our listeners who aren't in Madison, but still want to be involved? Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so we do have some online community groups and, uh, Bible studies. So we have registration open right now for community groups and Bible studies too, which I think is a great place to do this in community. Um, and both of those have online options as well. So if you're listening and you're not, we actually have a lot of people in online groups and Bible studies that don't live in Madison. So you can sign up for one of those. Um, but like I said, there's lots of like podcasts and books and stuff too. Uh, I think that's it. Well, and I mean this podcast, right? Yeah. We can count as a, as a tool for people. There you go. We're, yeah, we're tools. (laughs) No, 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 anyway. That was a bad okay, joke. That was a bad joke. <laughs> we, we're not ending on a bad joke. No. <laughs> I will end on this. Um, for those of you who are in the process of deconstructing or know someone who is deconstructing, or maybe you've turned the corner and you, you've made the decision to reconstruct, or you know what this process is like, there's hope. Don't do it alone. Jesus is with you. And he wants to build a bigger and more beautiful house for you. That's why we're going through this process. You're not alone. Uh, Hang in there. We're there with you. And join us next week as we are talking about the um, topic of what if I love Jesus, but struggle with Christians. We've all been there. We've all been there. All right. Well, great uh, talking with you guys today and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.